is your story, this is my story. But most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations. The Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab king of Israel had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers, again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. Those may be some of the most difficult words to hear. There is no remedy. You have battled with cancer, and the doctor is finally obligated to say those words to you. There is no remedy. You're going to die. You have battled through a difficult marriage, and finally your spouse says to you, there is no remedy. It's time for a divorce. You have struggled to make your business work, but finally the bank says those painful words, there is no remedy. It's time to shut it down. This is where God is at with Israel. And he is finally forced to say, there is no remedy. How did Israel get here? Well, we have learned through our journey in the story that God established the nation of Israel from scratch as his plan to reveal himself and to provide a way to get all people back. To do this, he gave Israel the law, which instructs Israel on how life with God works, how to love God, how to love each other. People would see how life and community with God works and be drawn to God as the one true God who loves them as well. But Israel didn't keep up to their end of the bargain. For hundreds of years, God patiently waited and warned them. He gave them second chances and even third chances, but they would not listen. God would be justified in scrapping the whole plan and starting over with a new group of people, but he made an unconditional promise to Abraham that the Messiah, the one who would provide the way back to God, would come from Israel. Specifically, the Messiah would come from David's family, the tribe of Judah. So we have seen over the last few chapters that God whittles Israel down to a small remnant, the once big, unstoppable, unified nation of Israel is divided in two north and south. The northern kingdom of Israel, made up of ten of the twelve tribes of Israel, is captured by a pagan nation called the Assyrians and deported and assimilated into their pagan culture in 722 BC. Only the southern kingdom of Judah remains. While Judah did have five good kings over a 350 year period, they were as evil as the northern kingdom. Now here's a good example at the opening of chapter 17. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. 
and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. Now, I really believe in giving young people opportunities to lead, but I think becoming a king when you're in junior high may be a bit much. I think there should be a rule that you can't become king until you're done with acne. It certainly proves to be the case for Manasseh. He didn't just do evil in the eyes of the Lord. The story tells us he did much evil, shed so much innocent blood, did more evil than the Amorites. The Amorites, these are the people who were so evil that God stripped the land of Canaan from them and gave it to the Israelites. God would be totally just in starting over if it weren't for the promise. But it wasn't just Manasseh. Of the remaining six kings in Judah, only one, Josiah, is good. But he challenges my theory. He was only eight years old when he took the throne. Like in the northern kingdom, God raised up prophets to give the kings and the people his messages. It was time for Judah to hear God's plan in light of their persistent evil. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. If God continues to bless Judah, while they're living so inconsistent with God's word and life, it will send a confusing message about who God is and how life and community with God works. God must discipline them. He does so with a distinct purpose in mind. The prophet Ezekiel gives Judah this message. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. What does God do? He raises up another pagan nation, the Babylonians, who will do to Judah what Assyria did to Israel. Over a period of 20 years, they will capture them, burn down the city, destroy the beautiful temple that Solomon built, and deport the people to Babylon. This begins in 605 B.C. and is complete in 586 B.C. You know, these last couple of chapters haven't exactly been the kind of pick-you-up messages you need to inspire you. But they are true. And we need to give you the whole Word of God, not just the nice parts. Remember this. Grace isn't all that fantastic if you don't know you need it. And boy, do we need it. But there is a, a bright spot, something inspirational in this message that I think we can all take with us into the world to encourage us. It has to do with the prophet Jeremiah. Listen to his story. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God tells Jeremiah that before he was even born, he had an idea of what part Jeremiah would play in the unfolding of God's upper story. That's awesome. But the same is true for us today. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 of the New Testament reads, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God is saying the same thing to everyone hearing these words, who professes Jesus the Messiah, their Savior. This is not just for Jeremiah, but for everyone who belongs to Christ. He already has things in mind for you if you will align your life to the upper story of God. Now that's overwhelming. Jeremiah felt the same way. He said, I, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. You and I feel the same way, don't we? I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm not smart enough. Can't talk in front of people. Not dis disciplined enough to be counted on. And we go on and on. The story tells us that God reaches down and touches Jeremiah's mouth and tells him that he will be with him every step of the way. The same is true for New Testament believers. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that when Jesus returned to the Father, the Holy Spirit came down and touched us, 
gifted us, equipped us with everything we need to accomplish the assignment God has for us. What was Jeremiah's assignment? He was assigned the task of the weeping prophet. God told him that he would give out God's message, but the people would not listen. He's essentially telling him that he's going to fail in the world's eyes. God tells Jeremiah that Judah needs to know that the devastation they are going to experience soon is not really from the Babylonians, but discipline from God's hands. There is a principle in this for us. In God's employment contract, he doesn't ask us to be successful by the world standards, but faithful. Success is faithfulness to God, not results. God told Jeremiah to stay behind in Jerusalem after Judah was exiled to see the ruins and write down what he saw. Jeremiah is standing in a pile of rubble. And the people are walking in single file to the east, to Babylon, smoldering embers from the fire. The temple that Solomon built for the Lord destroyed, and he weeps bitterly and writes a book in the Old Testament called Lamentations, which means to weep. But there's a bright spot. Amidst all the tough love and discipline, God tells Jeremiah to tell Judah that he's going to bring them back home. Maybe you've heard these words before and didn't know it came from the lips of Jeremiah to the now exiled nation of Judah. Yet this I call to mind and therefore have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. With God's people, there is never a strong, truthful bout of loving discipline without God's grace following right behind it. It was true for Judah, 